Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessings, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord, who is, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere the Christ your Lord always. Be prepared, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your hope that you have. But this is gentleness and respect and keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak allegedly against you good behavior in Christ would be ashamed of their slander. So, so be it. <laughs> well, if you don't know it, for you guys that are just clueless, today is Valentine's Day. And if you don't know it, I guarantee you that your wife does know it. Okay? And I, I thought about wearing red, but the only red shirt I had was an Angry Birds t-shirt, so I <laughs> didn't do that. No, I'm not so angry, am I? No. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we know what love is because you first loved us. And Lord, help us to contemplate today and every day on the love that you have given us through Christ Jesus. And not only have you redeemed us through Christ, but you created us to be a holy people in a relationship with you. And you, through Christ's blood, through his triumph on the cross, will renew us to a new paradise, to be in a relationship that's exponentially greater with you, all because you chose to love us. Lord, help us to be love and light in this world, that we may show others Jesus Christ's love for them. We just thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. So Wednesday night, I was asking Awanas, I said, what did you learn? And they said, Jesus loves me. You know, we say it all the time, but do we realize it? And I don't know if you realize it, but the Bible, in the Bible, Jesus never says he loves you. We'll talk more about that, though. He you know, once tell a disciple he loves them anything else. Can you show, <laughs> thinking about that, can you show love without ever saying those three little words? Of course you can. Okay. So I entitled this message, Prove It. You might see where I'm going with that. We've gone over so far the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is what? To love the Lord your God with everything that you have and then to love your neighbor as yourself and even as Christ loved and died for them. We went over the great commission so far that you have been given by Jesus because he has all authority in heaven and earth to be his hands and feet, to go out and tell people about the hope that we have, that, that salvation has come to man. And we've been commissioned and empowered to do that. And when we do that, when they see from the verse that, that Polly and Merle read that we live a different life, that we love one another because that's how we're known, then they'll ask us about that hope. And then hopefully they'll convert, but then we have the responsibility of making them into disciples to train them up. And we have that responsibility to do it where we live, in our surrounding areas, and then to the utter, utter ends of the earth. Not utter as in a cow, but utter. Kind of, kind of tongue-tied on that one. Okay. Then I went over a new fishing philosophy. that we, It's got to be this new transformed mind that the Spirit is renewing. That we realize that we're not fishing for men anymore. I mean, for fish anymore. Well, we don't think of things that way, but that was their occupation. Everything that we live for and do, we've got to go up and go, go to work today. We're working for the king of all kings, and we're working to bring people into the kingdom. Work on this earth 
to feed us and clothe us, God's going to do anyway, that's kind of secondary to what God has called us to do. So we have to have that new fishing philosophy. Then we went over the P.S. I love you letters that Jesus wrote. 60, 70 years after he left this earth, he wrote to the churches, you're doing a good job in most cases, but here we need some improvement. That wasn't the case in all of them. And we even have one letter where there's no uh, commending them whatsoever. Why? Because they're lukewarm in what they do. Not that they don't have actions, but they're lukewarm in their love. And we remember when we start those letters that the first church is commended for their relationship, but it's not like their first love. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Then we talked about the, if you have ears, you need to listen up. Not just you, but the churches, because we don't want to lose focus on that. It's not about me, it's about being connected into a body of people, of believers. I talked to a Juana's parent about that Wednesday night, because she said, I'm not going to church anywhere right now. And I said, well, you opened up that can of worms, why not? You know, I said, God has given you through the Holy Spirit gifts to be shared. I said, and if you're my arm, you have restricted me because now I have one arm because you're not part of the body of Christ. And she understood that, and, and you know, that's where we left it. I said, you opened up that can of worms. <laughs> if you want to do that, just mention something like that to me, and I'll go with it. Right, Polly? Then we talked about living as though you have eternal life. Not living because you're going to get eternal life, but because you know that you have eternal life, that you live like you have it now. If you know that you have a million dollars in the bank account now, because that's what you have, you have so much more than that, then spend it lavishly now. Pull upon the Holy Spirit. Do things that you never thought you could do before. The early church, people sold things that they had because they didn't consider them their own and helped others to live a better life, ones that were suffering. And I think exactly that when Beth said that about the people in Romania. I don't know unless she tells me, but then my heart burns and sure I can pray. But James is clear on that. What good is it to pray and not do something about your brother or sister that's in need? And God does give to those who give. It's literally as though He is giving through us. So we have to live like we have that eternal life. Not like the religious leaders of that day who were actually the thieves that were robbing and stealing the children of Israel. They were taking them, blind leaders, leading the blind to eternal destruction. Instead, we need to live like we are sons and daughters of the Most High, like we will take seriously Jesus saying, come and follow after me and I will make you fishers of men. We need to be light and salt to this earth. For what good is salt if it loses its saltiness? What good is a light that is hid? I want to go over my verses also, just to review there. John 10.10, 10, this is my little verses that I'm putting in the jar and contemplating on. And this is in the order that we've put them in there. John 10.10 10 said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And I'm only reading you the parts that's on the card. There's more to that verse. We talked about it. Luke 10.20 says, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Matthew 5.12, Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew seven twelve. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. And my verse from this week was Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Just look at the pattern that's right there just from pulling out these words of Scripture that Jesus has told us. Words to live by. More than the bread that we eat. This spiritual food. This this eating and consuming Jesus because He is the bread of life that will nourish us in this world and forever and ever. So the question from Revelation is, is do you want to overcome? How are you doing? And for most of us, at least for me, do I need to repent? Do I need to change the way that I'm thinking about something? And if I need to, then what am I going to do about it? Because it doesn't do any good to think or hear and not obey. I have to put that into a living action. I have to take 
time and thought process to change what I'm doing now so that I can be more like the hands and feet of Jesus Christ instead of living my life as though he is not king of my life, as though I don't have any hope. So here we are on Valentine's Day, ironically today, the day of love. <laughs> love is in the air. Yeah, okay. It reminds us to show our love. So I've got some new questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? He was, either, he was either a good prophet or he was whatever, but he didn't claim that. He claimed that he was God. He claimed that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. He claimed that if you believe him, you will follow him. He claimed that if you love others, by that you will be known as his disciples. Those are Jesus' words for you to live by. He came what he accomplished to do. For you, he gave up heaven. Oh, he didn't just give up a pretty place to live. He gave up being God in the heavenly realms of something you and I cannot even begin to comprehend. Why? Because he wanted you back into a right relationship with him. You were created to be in one in the first place, to have fellowship and communion, to share love and intimacy with him. And he came, gave up heaven, and died so that you could be redeemed. He came and accomplished what he came to do. And he commissioned you and I to be his hands and feet until he returned. Will he return as he promised? And will you be the spotless bride ready and waiting for him? Will this church be that? I want to remind you again of Jesus' first charge, Matthew 4, 19. Come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will change all of your thought process about what was important in life to tell you what is important in life now, and that's reconciling men to God before it's too late. And you have the privilege to be a part of that. And you don't have to do it. Jesus will do it for you. He will be the one that makes you into that fishers of men. You have to be obedient. You have to change your way of thinking. You have to read your Bible. You, you have to uh, congregate with other Christians. You have to know your spiritual gifts and use them. And I could go on and on. But he will do it for you. Look at all the Old Testament stories of the hero, heroes that couldn't do these things but did mighty things because of the mighty God that was doing it through them. Don't you want that to be your life? Don't you want your life to matter? Because on a tombstone, it's just that little dash, right? What is that little dash going to tell about you? And what are the eternal rewards that you're building up in heaven rather than worrying about the things of this earth that will be melted away? And then his last words to us as he was ascending into heaven in Acts 1.8, you will receive power to do this. To do what? To be my witnesses. That word means to testify even to the point of martyrdom. That nothing else matters but telling others about Jesus Christ. And I think I said it be going into this. I could say it without even using words. I could show it in my actions. Now then comes a time they're going to ask. There are going to be words too and we're vocal people. But I'm going to show it more to others by the way I live my life by loving acts of kindness in the body of Christ and loving acts of <clears throat> kindness outside of the body of Christ. Different than the world. So they say, why did he stop and do this for me? Why, why did they pray for me? Whatever it is. There's something different here, and I want to know what this is. And especially in our world where the church is so watered down, you want to look different than other Christians. Because we don't want to look like the Pharisees again, the ones that were actually thieves, robbing them of the life that Jesus came to offer. If you're not living as Jesus commanded and empowered you to live in this world, then what do you think he's going to say when he does return as he promised? And oh, let me remind you, he's going to separate the goats from the sheep whether they're in the same pen, in the same church, whatever you want to say, he knows. He knows those who love 
him and who don't. Do you love Jesus oh, for the things that he has done for you? The year before last, I challenged you to read through your Bible. A lot of you did that. Last year, I challenged you to read through the New Testament and meditate on that and think about the scriptures. And we went along, and COVID was even a good thing in that because it got me to give a daily message that would help inspire you or teach you something or whatever if you, if you did take the time for that. It also kept us on it because, you know, you kept me on it for sure because I couldn't get behind. <laughs> and my days on that time were crazy, whether you know that or not, because our business was four times what it normally was. And then we became shorthanded, and I don't go any deeper than that. So it was Sherry and I literally, and Terry helped, not to say he didn't, but literally when we got up in the morning till we went to bed at night, I, yeah, I, scriptures went through my head, but I didn't open it up until time that I sat down but I would have never sat down and did that video and studied if it wouldn't have been for my commitment to you. I would have got distracted. Because with four times the work, where does that fit into an eight-hour day? Right there, that's more than you have hours for. Sherry and I don't know how we did it. But generally, when I started doing this and doing that video, it was at midnight, and I'd finish at 2 a.m., and then she'd get up and get started in the morning until I'd roll out at 7.30, whatever time it was. And I have no idea how we did it, except the Holy Spirit empowered us to do that. But because I had a commitment to God and I had a commitment to you, to God, to you, <laughs> to suffer, to sacrifice, so that we could stay firm in our foundation through this thing called COVID, which has turned the world upside down. And as we heard from Beth, we don't know what's going on in, in other places. You don't even know what's going on in other cities. I just came from Spokane Saturday and talked to some of the pastors. Well, I think all the pastors were either there or on Zoom that are in this uh, Spokane district. And I told you before, the church in Missoula, I found out from his mouth, has met two times since March whenever last year. Two times, that's it. James, the church we went to, his wife hasn't stepped foot in the church since that day. She has an elderly mother that she cares for, so she's not there by her husband's side. And I prayed with him, and I said, I, I know she needs to be by your side. So he has to go in because of his commitment to, the, to God and to the people, and he does love them, and that's why he does it. But his wife's not there with him. Another place, another church lost where they met because of COVID. I don't know the circumstances. So they're coming to James's church to meet after they do. I don't know what their time schedules are and stuff. And we look in Bonner's Ferry and we're like, what's COVID? Don't take me wrong in that. It's gone through this church and it's very serious. And I know exactly what uh, Brad and um, his wife are going through. I know what it took a toll on Carl and Sherry and, and, and everybody else. But here we are living as if it really doesn't affect us much. But in Romania, I don't know if these people are, how they're going to make it. They've already exhausted their funds. They've exhausted their credit. What do you live off ne of next? Except maybe, just maybe, that God wants to use you to help them. I don't know. I don't have the big picture. This year, I did something much more simple. And whether you understand that, and that's why I keep reiterating it, get a little pack of cards. 50 little bitty phrases that if you take time and look at it and contemplate those, there's some deep words. Let me read them to you again. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. It is more blessed to give than receive. And apply that to how you live. You can read all of this period and there are plenty of people that have read this through and through and through but don't apply it to their lives because they don't love God because they don't love Jesus. Oh, they'll take the salvation part. Oh, yeah, who doesn't want that? But Jesus said plainly, you must confess, believe in your heart, and confess with, in, with your mouth that he is Lord. 
that he's Lord of everything in your life because he gave up everything to save your life. Are you in that kind of relationship? And if you look throughout the, the Word, if you read the Old Testament through too, you'll know that God demands a holy people. Nothing's changed in the New Testament. We are to be holy, set apart, and He sanctifies us and makes us holy and then empowers us to be holy people. Something that the Old Testament saints never had is the Spirit of the living God living inside of you. You can truly be like Paul and in any circumstance say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Last week I watched Polly's sermon finally. And she's not my pet or anything, but I'll say that she's doing exactly what I'm talking about and I find it so wonderful. Because she went through from reading and she said it in that to where she was reading it again and hungering and thirsting for it, falling in love. To this time when she read Revelation, she said, all I saw was hope. How can you read Revelation and see hope unless you have hope? genuine hope so you can read the thing and say you know these are things that are going to happen but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if we're out of here not out of here if we suffer anything else it doesn't matter if this is a metaphor or literal it matters that in the end paradise will be restored exponentially for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus there is nothing that can happen to me that matters because I'll see Jesus face to face and I'll be with him forever and it will be so blessed. Exponentially. How can I be quiet? I have got to tell the world. I've got to live like that. Like I'm madly in love. So I told you Wednesday night I asked the Wana kids what they learned and they said, they said, first God loves me. Well, that's pretty clear. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, there it is, that what? What he did shows his love, because he didn't say it right there, that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But I challenged them to go find a verse anywhere that said Jesus loves them, because it's not there. And it doesn't have to be there, because the pages are covered, written in red, the things that Jesus has done for you because He loves you. Words speak so much louder than actions. Sherry, you're going to be mad at me, but that's okay. Let's give them an example. Here's example A. I love you, honey. Here's example B. Come on. Come on, precious. Your hands are cold. Uh, they are cold. <laughs> right here. All right. Did I need to say the words? 
Come on. Which one did you believe more? I love you or the other stuff? <sighs> we have this thing called a dishwasher. <laughs> so I, I hope that image stays with you. Oh, yeah, she needs another bite. Okay. Two bites. Now you're getting it everywhere. Oh, it's in the way? Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Jesus said, you will be known by your love for one another. James said, I said it before, what good is it to say you love one, to say you have faith, and not have the actions that prove it? That's why Jesus wrote those love letters back to the church. In most cases, he said, you're doing a good job, but you need more of me in your life. Because I mean more to you in your life. That's why you're not doing as you did in your first love. Why you're not doing these special things. And Sherry's not kidding. We don't do Valentine's Day. If you want to know more about that, that's a different sermon or a different talk. But Valentine's Day has not been the best day ever for us. But we choose to love each other because, number one, God first loved us. Number two, that I choose to love her, she chooses to love me, no matter what happens in this world. That we've made a commitment to each other. we become one. And we're not going to let anybody tear that apart, not even our selfish selves. So we committed to loving God and loving each other and loving others. The reason Jesus never said, I love you, is because he proved it. There's your title. There is no doubt whatsoever, but the world does not know this. The world thinks, I watched a video last night, I'm not going to share it with you. It's a rapper that was saying, why God? I just run across it looking at things, and I was like, wow. Why, you know, why could you let all this happen? You say that you love me, all these things, but yet this continues to happen. And that is exactly what the world sees, especially when they see hypocritical Christians. Because they expect us, if, if, if what we say we believe is true, then how can we live differently than that? How can we hold grudges? How can we not do something to help? How can we, like the priest or the Levite, pass by on the other side of the road, and then I get help from someone who does not believe as we believe, simply because they're a good person. What does that say about my hypocrisy? I should be known by the way I live my life to be like Jesus. And that takes intentional effort, intentional suffering, changing my times around, whatever it might be, intentional faith that God will supply back to me, whatever the things are. So this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, if you don't know that. And you can go look. I won't explain all that to you, but it's, it's important in the church. Ash Wednesday is a time of repentance. It's a time when you can rub ashes on yourself. But it goes back to the Old Testament and New Testament and still today. Of where if you truly believe what God has done for you, that you'll repent. That you'll realize how naked how shameful, how blind you are. And you'll turn to God for healing, and that healing will come through Jesus Christ. It starts the, the 40 days of Lent that go up to the time where Jesus comes in uh, on Palm Sunday, then Holy Week, then Easter, to give you just a brief. So Wednesday kicks that off. I challenge you again 
to think about that Wednesday. Whether you sit down and rub ashes on you or you just think about it, that's up to you however you want to do it. But unless you get deliberate about thinking about how you can be a better Christian, then you probably won't be. It'll simply be kumbaya, I go to church. You've got to do something. You've got to decide what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, no matter the cost. You walk by faith, who's going to walk with you, whatever else. And you've been given a challenge already this morning with Beth. I haven't heard back from her, but my answer to her was, you know, how and how much? How can we help? I can't go over there and cut firewood for them, so I'm limited in things I can do, but we can help financially. But can we? Do we have the funds to do it? The man who got his crops in that night didn't give, and that was the whole reason he got his crops. And then later God said, you fool, I'm taking your life from you. Your life is because God created you to honor Him, to be holy, to witness to others about His existence. And then your new life in Jesus Christ, John 10.10, 10, is to have abundant, powerful life because Jesus gives it to you. He is the one that will make you into a fisher of men. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, read this way. Dear brother and sister, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to, to you as though you belonged to this world, or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another, and you quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? This is Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Those that have said they believed, those that have set themselves apart from this world to be a light to this world. They may be even suffering for Him, but they're not in love with Jesus because they're quarreling and living like the world. goes on to say in verse 10 of chapter 3, Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building upon it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one we have already laid, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. We are a body made up of individual parts, and we will be judged. <clears throat> The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like somebody, someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys His temple, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves if you think you are wise by the world standards. You need to be a, become a fool to be truly wise. Paul was passionately telling this church that he would show them a more excellent way, a way of love. Love. Love co covers a multitude of sins. Love is the thing that will last in heaven. Faith becomes real reality. Hope becomes our sight. Love continues on and on and on because God loved us first. And if you believe that, you will love others. Jesus never said, I love you. He never said, I love Alan. He never said, I love you. He never said, I love Peter. He did say, Peter, do you love me? He didn't have to because of everything he did that proved it without any doubt. That's why I gave you the example, plus I gave it to make my wife feel special, even though she said no Valentine's Day stuff. So I'll be in trouble later, but that's okay. 
But the things that we do show how much we love our Lord because of what He's done for us. By that, they will know that we are His disciples. I guess my point is, if you say that you love Jesus, prove it. We're going to close with a video, not close the service, but this sermon. And as soon as the video is over, we're going to take communion. I'm going to pass out the elements while the um, 